Hello, I am so excited about this recording. It is such a great interview. I talked to Jeffrey Hunter of the National Parks Conservation Association. And the cool thing about this conversation is that it all started when I posted a video, am I too old for wildlife biology careers? That's a question I get asked a lot. And by old, I don't mean old. I mean, people ask me this in their late 20s and early 30s, but they are feeling insecure about maybe starting this career when they've had some other work experience under their belt. So when I posted this on LinkedIn, Jeffrey commented, that's me. He started his career in wildlife biology when he was 40 and he transitioned from a corporate background. So this conversation is all about that, but even if you're not older and you know you wanna be a wildlife biologist or go into wildlife biology careers, this interview is chock full of good information that will help you get jobs. It has some good inside information on working for the government, working for nonprofits, and just career skills in general that will help you stand out. So definitely listen to the whole thing. And then at the end, I have some takeaways of things I. I, I really learned and I, and I really want to expand upon um, afterwards. Hello, Jeffrey, and welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to chat with you today. Thanks, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be here. So the reason why I invited you on the podcast is because I originally had this post talking about the topic, am I too old to go into wildlife biology careers? <laughs> and to clarify for, for everyone out there, when I say old, I don't mean really that old at all. Like people ask me this in their late twenties or early thirties. And I did a Facebook live on it, but you commented on it and you said something along the lines of that's me. Can you tell us about your background and how you started your career in wildlife? Sure. Um, happy to. So I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in the lower Hudson Valley of New York State, and I worked in the telecommunications industry for 20 years. Um, uh, specifically, the last company I was with, it was the same company, a series of mergers with Verizon. And they had a very generous tuition reimbursement program, and they actually paid for me uh, to go to school to get an environmental studies degree at a state school in New York called Empire State College. Um, and so, you know, that, that job with Verizon paid well, it put my kids through college, it allowed me to buy a home, but there was something missing, you know, it was just, it was a job. Um, and so I yearned for more, I yearned to do something to align my uh, values with my career. And it was a long process, it involved getting a degree, it involved a lot of personal research, a lot of reading and um just getting to understand. A mentor once said, what you're looking for is depth and breadth. You don't want to have just a shallow bit of knowledge. And uh, in 2003, about a year and a half after walking the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine, um, I, I bought a house in Tennessee and about six months later took a job with American Hiking Society and the National Park Service. So that was my transition to the nonprofit sector. Um, the focus of that first job was primarily recreation, and my values are more centered around conservation. Mm -hmm. um, so it took another five years to actually be offered a position to lead the Tennessee Wild Wilderness Campaign. Um, and so that was fascinating, working in Southern Appalachia. Uh, that lasted five and a half years and led to a position out in California in a high desert environment, working on a, na uh, a national monument campaign for a place called the Bodie Hills. Um, that campaign flamed out, I guess is the best way to put it. There wasn't a lot of local support. And so I started looking for another job and found uh, the job I currently hold with National Parks Conservation Association um, in here in Western North Carolina and, and Tennessee. Um, and I find myself today working with the park on, uh, I facilitate the work of the Smoky Mountains Bearwise Community Task Force that seeks to uh, mitigate human wildlife conflict, usually around trash. 
Uh, and I also facilitate the work of the Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Connectivity Project, which is focused on a 28 mile stretch of Interstate 40 in the Pigeon River Gorge just outside the Smokies. Um, so That's it, so cool. And you use, you use camera traps to do that? I saw you had a couple of blog posts on camera traps. Yes, it's, uh, it's a pretty significant research project that we are just concluding now. We had about 120 wildlife cameras in a 28 mile stretch of highway looking to see um, what wildlife is encroaching on the right of way. And we're, we have two other research objectives. One is to monitor the existing use of passage structures uh, mm -hmm. under and above the highway. We have culverts and we have a land bridge over a double tunnel. Uh, and then we are collecting uh, mortality data to try to see what's getting killed and where is it getting killed. And that's filling in a puzzle that will hopefully allow us to mitigate um, some of this mortality. Would, does a land bridge look like the ones, and I think it's in Banff National Park where it's like these really cool bridges and they're all vegetated across. That's the big, hairy, audacious goal. So yeah. what we have right now is if you've driven uh, from Raleigh to Knoxville on I-40, um, about five miles before you hit the Tennessee state line, the highway um, goes through a tunnel system in both directions. And so when they tunnel through the mountain, they left the vegetation on top. Yeah. And it, and it creates a land bridge. So this isn't something that was constructed. It was something that was sim simply left in place as part of the construction of the roadway. Oh, nice. Okay, so going back to your, to your corporate career, it was encouraged that you could just get any degree. And did you, did you choose environmental studies or did Verizon um, kind of like present that opportunity to you? Sure. So, um, you know, it, like any story, this one is pretty complex and there's a lot to it. Um, you know, I was trying to fill the hole that the corporate world wasn't satisfying by volunteering. Uh, I got involved in some citizen science projects, um, a breeding bird survey, a herpetological survey where we were um, looking at um, mostly frogs, toads, and salamanders crossing a road in an area that we eventually turned into a state park. Um, but, and, and, and I have forgotten your question. I'm sorry. Um, just how, so, so I guess you already liked wildlife and you were already interested in conservation. So um, I guess what my question is like, were they just encouraging you to get a degree in general or was it specific to environmental sciences? Okay, that, that's, where I, that's where I went adrift. <laughs> so um, some of your, uh, Listeners to your podcast might find this somewhat amusing, but this this is a true story. So in the 1980s, I attended a Grateful Dead concert at Madison Square Garden. It was a benefit for uh, the Rainforest Action Network. I've always been a forest guy. I grew up as a, I had a feral mm -hmm. childhood. I was in the woods and speakers in between musical acts were talking about tropical forest systems and native peoples. And I thought, you know, this is something that is not talked about in my community. So I started a nonprofit group and started raising awareness um, in schools in the Hudson Valley area in New York State. I actually spoke, I spoke to about 120,000 students over a seven year period. And about halfway through there, uh, I gave a presentation at an elementary school in Goshen, New York. And a couple days later, I ran into one of the parents of the students and he, he said to me, what did you do in my son's class the other day? And of course that was really unsettling. I thought, what are they <laughs> Gosh, what did I do wrong? Um, he said, my son is still talking about the presentation yeah. you gave. He says, what are you doing at the phone company? Uh, this gentleman, Michael Edelstein, is a professor at Ramapo College in New Jersey. And his wife at the time was a professor at Empire State College. And he said, between Deborah and I, we need to find you a way to get a degree and get out of the corporate world. So, you know, it wasn't all my, I owe, I owe a lot of this to people who looked out for my welfare, who, um, mm -hmm who saw some value or I didn't necessarily see it. So uh, that wow, set me on the a path. Great story. And so, so you were working full time and then you got a degree at the same time. Was that challenging? It was, you know, I was raising kids and um, Empire State College is a non-traditional school in that it has small group study, um, flexible scheduling. Um, and that really worked well for me because I was actually uh, a manager in a data center. So I would work two months of days and two months of nights. My schedule was in constant flux. 
So if I attended any you know, university with a traditional class setting, there would always be a conflict of about one month um, during any semester. So I needed to look for a, a different sort of program that worked for my schedule. And can I ask how old you were when you made this transition or when you graduated? Um, sure, I graduated in um, 2003. So I was 41 at the time. Um, okay. So, so were you worried about being too old for the career then? Like these other people are asking me, were you, did that concern you at all that you wouldn't be able to compete with people just graduating in their 20s? I mean, sure, I had some doubts because, you know, when you work for one organization for 20 years, I hadn't even interviewed for a job in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was pretty insulated from that whole process. Um, I did have some confidence in my public speaking abilities, though, and that that was a real uh, boost for my for my efforts. But I think my biggest concern was salary. Um, yeah, I, I realized that you know I would have to take a cut in pay in order to align my career with my values, and you know it was a difficult decision to make, but um, I made it. No financial advisor would probably tell me to do that, but no regrets whatsoever. And, you know, today I'm making significantly more money than I did at the phone company. All right. Well, that's great to hear that, that you're able to, to bounce back. Um, and I wanted to ask you, so after, okay, so you graduated and then you got your first job. Was it difficult for you to get your first job? Because you had a, a bachelor's degree, right? You didn't have any... I, I understand that you're getting your master's degree right now. I, I saw that on your bio. I wasn't sure if that was current or not. So I, I'm, I've been pursuing a master's at Unity um, College in Maine. Uh, it's, this is a you know, teleprogram. Uh, and in the last year and a half, I stepped back from it simply because my work is pretty intense right now. Mm -hmm. And then COVID came along. And so it turned everything upside down. Um, you know, in terms of, my ability, I think the first job that I interviewed for after Verizon was an executive director of a nature center. And I totally, completely bungled the interview. Um, you know, I walked out of there shaking my head. And so I, you know, I redoubled my efforts. I talked to some folks. I um, revisited my cover letter, um, my resume. And there was a book back then that I consulted called What Color Is Your Parachute? Uh, which had really good tips on interview techniques. Um, so the next job I uh, applied for was the one that I was offered. Uh, it was wow. a joint position with American Hiking Society and the National Park Service Rivers, Trails and Conservation Assistance Program based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I opened uh, American Hiking Society's first regional office. And uh, one interesting tip, I played to my strength in that interview. Now, not, not everybody's going to say yes to what I asked, um, I had the first phone interview. And when I was offered a face-to-face -face interview, I asked if I could make a presentation as part of that interview. Um, was told that I could. And at that point, I felt I was, I was coming at this from a position of strength, having done so much public speaking. Uh, that's, that's great. And I actually, I mean, just hearing your story, my guess is that your experience at Verizon probably helped you get, get the job. And in these discussions with people who are concerned about age, I think they're worried that they don't have that, that longevity of wildlife work. But what I try to tell them is that they can um, pivot or, or market their, their, their skills that they've used in these other jobs to fulfill the wildlife positions. That doesn't have to be the exact same thing. And in some ways, I actually think you might be more competitive with those skills because um, they might be seeking things that a lot of wildlife biologists aren't taught, like customer service, and, and which can translate to um, public communication. Well, I was actually going to make that point about, about customer service, because that's one of the most important skills that I've gained you know, over my career. At Verizon, everyone that I dealt with internally, if the output of my work was the input to someone else's work, they were my customer. And we were expected to treat them as customers internally. Um, and so, you know, that customer focused um, strategy is something I use to this day with my colleagues at, 
National Parks Conservation Association. If I have a deadline for someone who's putting together a newsletter, they're, they're my customer. Uh, and I have, to meet, I have to meet their deadline so that they can do their job. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I was just um, surprised by you landing a job right away. That's awesome because now I follow a lot of the wildlife Facebook groups, like the Wildlife Workers Network, um, and there's just constant chatter about how people have to go from temp position to temp position, and they're not able to find jobs. A lot of people are going to graduate school because they can't find jobs. So I was wondering if if um, do you think maybe times have changed and things are just more competitive or, or like it really was your Verizon experience that helped you a lot? Well, in addition to, you know, my customer service experience, I volunteered uh, at the community level for several different groups That's true, uh, yeah. while I was an employee with Verizon. And so one group I worked with, Sterling Forest Partnership, um, with them, I learned to uh, do outdoor leadership, to lead hikes, to interpret mm -hmm the forest to people, uh, to raise money, to put on special events, uh, advocacy skills. We were trying to create a new state park um, in New York. And uh, the other plan was to build 14,000 14, houses and 8 million square feet of commercial office space in an intact 18,000 acre forest. And we were successful turning it into a state park. So those skills certainly were brought to bear. Um, in my first job, uh, and then I was able to build on those skill sets by mm -hmm. uh, by having mentors, people who um, could point me in the right direction, um, help me out, give me advice that uh, I could then build upon. Uh, Where did you seek those mentors from? The organizations you're working for, or from your degree program? Sure. As I mentioned, the the first job. Uh, in the nonprofit sector was a joint position with the National Park Service and an NGO, American Hiking Society. And so um, one of my Park Service colleagues, Allison Bullock, was a community planner. So I started this job in April of 2003. And one of the tasks that I needed to do was to organize a conference by October. Uh, I'd never put together a conference. I'd put together some um, you know, single day events, uh, Sterling Forest Conservation Day, where we had talks and hikes and different events, food. Um, so Allison just informally took me under her wing. And, um, you know, I could see she was super sharp and willing to share her information. So I just, I listened, I tried to be a sponge and uh, take in as much information as I could. And, you know, that relationship um, is one that I cherish. And we just had a conversation last week uh, about her respective work and my work. Uh, where there might be a nexus here someday, again, coming back to work together again. And can you tell people about your job right now? So you're senior program manager. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Sure. Um, I, I don't know that it really reflects accurately what I do. It just happens to be a position level within mm -hmm. my employer, National Parks Conservation Association. For folks who may not be familiar with that organization, uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were founded in 1919. Our mission is to advocate to protect and enhance America's national parks for present uh, and future generations. So my work is generally centered in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, so the park units that fall under my portfolio include Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and the Appalachian National Scenic Trail as well as some others, but those are the primary ones. And so I have two projects that are pretty sizable. Um, uh, the first is I'm the facilitator for the Smoky Mountains Bearwise Community Task Force. Uh, I work in that capacity with the Black Bear Coordinator at Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, Dan Gibbs, uh, and uh, the Supervisory Wildlife Biologist in the Smokies, uh, Bill Stiver and the former supervisor of wildlife biologist, Kim Delosier. And these are folks that I just, you know, when some folks are talking, I try to zip it and really listen and pay attention uh, because these are people with lots of expertise. Um, and my role there is a facilitator to help people have um, a successful meeting and, and reach some outcomes that they're striving for. Uh, the other project is on the facilitator again for the uh, Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Connectivity Project. Um, for those not familiar, the Pigeon River Gorge lies just outside the boundary of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 
Um, it's a multi-jurisdictional landscape. Um, it cuts through the Cherokee National Forest in Tennessee and the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. And there's a 28 mile stretch of highway that has a lot of mortality. Uh, so for the last three years, I've been facilitating the work of federal, state, tribal, and non-governmental organizations that are working collaboratively to try to address this issue and improve wildlife's ability to safely get across the road. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're meeting with a lot of people and, and talking to people. Is that what, you're, is that what your um, a day keep in life it, looks like? <laughs> it does, you know, keeping the train on the tracks, keeping the discussion yeah. going, addressing any bottlenecks, um, scheduling meetings, putting together agendas, running meetings, making sure we're talking about the right things. Um, I hired a wildlife biologist in October of 2018, uh, Steve Goodman. Um, and, you know, these positions are very, very competitive. I think I received 120 resumes uh, for that one position. So it was daunting just to review them all. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't say that to get people down. Um, I mean, you, you, you just need to persevere and you need to let, you need to have a passion for this kind of work, first of all. Uh, and when you talk to people, let that passion flow through you. When people see that, um, you know, it catches their attention. And it, it certainly caught my attention uh, in my interview with Steve. He had, he had the chops for, um, for what we were looking for. Um, Can you give any tips or make any comments about what stood out for you in the resumes and cover letters that you interviewed for for that job? Like how can you make your passion come across? Sure. Well, it was clear that, um, you know, Steve had done some research about the organization that I worked for, uh, about the area where we were seeking to do some work. Uh, and he had experience uh, doing a lot of field work. He worked um, at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida most recently, uh, mm -hmm. studying red cockaded woodpeckers and gopher tortoises. And he set up a camera trapping protocol for a uh, tortoise dens. Uh, so he had a lot of experience um, doing that. You know, interestingly, um, I've had a number of interns over the years and I really like to um, try to recruit the next generation. And so I was up against a situation where I had the candidate I eventually hired and another candidate who had interned with me, who was young and bright and personable. Um, and, you know, I ultimately I made a decision to hire the individual that um, could do the job, had, had managed a large camera trap project. Um, but it was, you know, it was one of the harder decisions I've ever made. Um, so I don't know that I could be any more specific than that. Uh, you know, there was an authenticity uh, about the cover letters um, and, and my interactions with people who made the short list for the job. Um, that's super important, just to be real, be yourself. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's, no, that's great because I know, like I said, from the job boards, there's people who apply and so many people apply for like hundreds of positions a year. And um, yeah, I know people are just always looking for, for good job tips uh, or good um, application tips to help them stand out. Um, do you have any advice for people? So you've worked for the government and you've worked for a nonprofit. Do you have any advice for people who wanna go into those two different sectors? Um, sure, uh, I mentioned earlier the depth and breadth comment. You know, you don't wanna be so narrowly focused as to have a, a super narrow skill set. You know, behind me is um, my personal library, and I spent a lot of time, my own time, you know, reading, researching, learning, um, and and that that I think is important. Um, but in my case, it's funny and when I was going to school in the nineties, I wanted to be a conservation biologist. I'd learned about the discipline, but I'm not the best at math. And so I thought, well, that's, it's not really a good fit for me. So in my case, you know, I found sort of the rear door to, to get in the room um, with skills like uh, facilitation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody who goes to meetings, you've, you've probably been to a meeting that's poorly run or, uh, has been inefficient. So helping people have those 
um, successful meetings it was, was one way for me to contribute and actually be a part of a, a team that's working on a, a really important wildlife conservation effort. I love that so much because just going back to the job competition thing, I think that so many people go through this process, but they really don't want to be a wildlife biologist. I think that they don't really understand what it's like. And like you said, it's really about the science and which of course involves math, but I think people want to have a job where they can have an impact and it's involved with wildlife and conservation. And there's just so many different ways to do that. And even when you look at nonprofit jobs, so many of them are not research-based. A lot of them are in fundraising um, and like project development, even law. I mean, there's a lot of different career opportunities. Well, to that point about fundraising, um, you know, one of the things I brought to the table with the job I have now is a successful track record of writing grants. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're a wildlife researcher, often you're grant dependent. You, ha you have to write grants. You have to find funding for your work. Uh, and that certainly helped me quite a bit. Um, you know, there, there are things that a government agency may require that you might not think to put on uh, a resume or on your skill sets. Mm -hmm. Being able to navigate with a map and compass or a GPS unit backcountry environment. You know, I, I spent, you know, years out in the woods. So I was comfortable in that environment and, and that really helped. But also, you know, driving um, unimproved roads on public lands. Um, it, it's something I take for granted because I've driven, you know, thousands of miles on, on gravel, dirt, bouncy roads over the years. Um, but, um, you know, the agency folks I work with at the BLM in California, I, um, I put together some volunteer programs for students and uh, they met with the students at the end of that program and helped them tweak their resume to make sure that the various skill sets they, that they have were actually captured. Um, and and to, to that extent, you know, not only being a volunteer, but then um, leading volunteers, putting together programs for the volunteers, um, you know, managing camp and making sure people are fed and safe. And, um, you know, that requires a, um, you know, wilderness first aid certification. Um, so there's, there's, when you start unpacking it, you know, today sitting here, it's hard sometimes to see all that has gone into it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just incremental, gaining those skills, gaining the knowledge, gaining the confidence, and then being in the right place um, at the right time certainly doesn't hurt. But having a network is, is important. I think we met on LinkedIn. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> The only social media that I do, I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. You know, I have a really robust network and without that network, I would not have the job I have today, nor would I have had my two prior jobs. That all came from networking. And is that just from your experience volunteering or how, how did you improve or, or get those great networks? Sure. Um, when I was with American Hiking Society, I wrote a monthly e-newsletter and one of the folks that, uh, received that newsletter regularly was Mark Shelley. At the time, he was the executive director of the Southern Appalachian Forest Coalition. Uh, today, he works for the National Forest Foundation. And he loved the way that I was presenting information and that led to conversations. And when he was looking to hire a wilderness organizer in Tennessee, he came over to my office to see if I knew anybody. And so Allison, my colleague and I sat with Mark um, and his colleague uh, Hugh Irwin, who now works for the Wilderness Society uh, in North Carolina. And at the end of the conversation, I looked at Allison and I said, I, I don't know anybody. And she said, I do. You. Um, <laughs> which, again, I'm not the most self-aware person sometimes. Uh, but, uh, you know, my previous connections with those folks. Um, and then uh, subsequently, one of my colleagues uh, at the Pew Charitable Trust, when I was leading the, the the Tennessee wild campaign, I reached out to her. I had some changes in my life going on. I said, Hey, you know, I, I, if anything comes up out West, can you, can you let me know? I'm interested in, I, I want to live out West uh, at some point in my life. And a couple of months later, her husband reached out to me with a job offer. And uh, so, you know, knowing people who know people in the industry who um, have some confidence in your abilities, um, I often tell people that 
you know, volunteering is so important, interning is so important because if I'm going to hire someone, I want to generally, if I can, hire a known quantity, someone who has a demonstrated an ability to deliver, uh, to meet deadlines, to do what it is that's asked of them, uh, um, to be a, you know, a good colleague in an office environment. Granted, there's no office environment today. <laughs> We're, you know, I'm in a home office. Um, so that's why volunteering is an opportunity to really prove yourself, not only to learn, but um, to, you know, put your name out there and, and show people that, you know, you're willing to work hard uh, and that, that could possibly lead to employment. Yeah, one thing always leads to another. I think LinkedIn is great. I actually didn't see really the utility of it for a long time because it's, it, it tends to be more corporate or, or people tend to get jobs on it or you talk about being successful on LinkedIn, they're, they're not in our field. But the great thing about LinkedIn is it's a great way to keep contact with your professional, um, with your professional network. So just like Facebook, I'm still friends with people I was you know, 10 years ago that I would have lost contact with. LinkedIn is the same way. So anytime I go to a conference and I meet somebody, like right away when I get back at to my hotel room, I look them up and I add them on LinkedIn if we've had a conversation together. And, and like you mentioned, it's also the person who's removed from you. So if you're applying for a job and you see like, oh, they know my former boss, then I can use that to talk to them. And I just think it's really great for that way for, for people who aren't on LinkedIn yet, they, they should get on it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I was an early adopter with LinkedIn. I don't know when I joined, but it was quite some time ago. Um, you know, and in essence, as things came across my feed, you know, I selected connections that actually allowed me to curate the sort of feed that that comes across every single day, and it's just fascinating the amount of conservation and wildlife information that that comes across LinkedIn on on a daily basis. And I'm grateful yeah. for that, and it 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 makes me um, it makes me a better employee, quite frankly. So, with your job right now, are you able to get outside a lot? A lot of people go into this career because they want to be outside. I am. Um, Last week, um, I went out in the field with my colleague. We stayed about 10 feet away and we wore masks the whole time. So we were socially distancing and um, we were uh, taking down a lot of our cameras as our two-year research project has just concluded. And so I went to a couple of sites um, to look at some cameras. And uh, you know, this required basically going off trail, up steep slopes and down the other side and, you know, briars and um, rhododendron. And, and maybe I'm making it sound dreadful. The fact of the matter is I'd rather be there than <laughs> sitting at a desk or um, in my office here. Yeah. Um, and this morning I had a, co a conversation with my, uh, my coworker, Steve. Um, the, there's a North Carolina Wildlife Research Commission study on spotted skunks that's um, being done. And so we were talking about some field work to deploy some cameras to gather some data for that study. Um, so hopefully that will get me out in the field again. Um, you know, when I'm, not, when I'm not out in the field for work, the, the Black Mountains, the highest mountain range in the Eastern US are about four miles that direction. So I'm often in the woods, you know, to hike, to look for wildlife sign, to um, recreate myself. Um, That's great. What, um, did you, or did you find any really cool animals on your camera traps? People always ask me this, like anything you weren't expecting or interesting behaviors? So we've um, been documenting uh, armadillos uh, in the Pigeon oh, River cool. Gorge. Yeah, we, on our e-mammal camera traps for, for North Carolina, I think we just had one armadillo, but it was in the West. So um, interestingly, you know, they have prehensile tails. So a lot of the mm -hmm. photographs that we've gotten, um, the armadillos will have uh, um, dry leaves mm -hmm. in their tail that they're carrying to line their den. Um, but I think one of the things that surprises me is the, the number of bobcats that there are uh, in the wild. I think in our two-year study, we, we have over 900 captures of bobcat. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, lots and lots. I mean, they're, they're stealthy, and um, they tend to avoid humans. Um, but 
they're, they're out there um, in, in pretty good numbers. Um, recently saw a photograph along the Pigeon River where a, a bear emerged from the river with a fish in its mouth, which was pretty That's neat. Cool. Um, yeah, I always love looking at the photos. It's even even with common animals, I still like looking through the pictures. Unless it's, unless it's like a, a card where there's a lot of people, like if it's on trail or something. And we usually don't put our camera traps on trail, but sometimes you have to do it in a way, like we, we do in people's yards a lot. So sometimes they do capture people a lot. Um, or internationally, like in Kenya, we'll get tons and tons of goats. So those ones aren't fun. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even the common animals, I just always, always like to see what they're up to. You know, one of the folks I work with at, at my job, um, his doctoral program, uh, he did some research in Kenya, camera trapping. Mm -hmm. um, and so th there's someone that I can go to. Um, I, you know, let me just mention that, um, you know, we're camera trapping for this research project in the Pigeon River Gorge. Um, but I've also uh, undertaken a partnership project, which is in Middle Tennessee. It's a partnership with the Metro Nashville Public School System and uh, the Stones River National Battlefield, which is the unit of the National Park System. And we've been placing cameras out in that park um, to see what sort of wildlife is there. And then the students have been reviewing the data and doing different projects. I think one class did a story map. Um, and so we're kicking it up a notch this year where the students, in addition to looking at um, additional camera trap data from Stones River, we're going to provide them with some data from our cameras uh, in Tennessee and North Carolina so they can compare, contrast wildlife awesome. species found in East Tennessee versus Middle Tennessee. You know, uh, yeah. they, don't, they don't have elk there. They don't have black bear in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, and, uh, you know, we're talk, talking to them about our objectives to uh, improve wildlife's ability to, to get over the highway. So they're learning about solutions to real world problems. And it's, uh, it's very exciting and rewarding. That's so great. I love that. Yeah, I found out through my job just how important it was to reach kids because once people are adults, if they don't have that experience with nature growing up, it's really hard for them to foster a conservation, um, environmentally friendly mindset. But if you get kids to fall in love with wildlife or caring about the environment when they're young, then it's just so much easier. You carry that through, through your life. Absolutely. So a lot of these kids are, you know, they're growing up in an urban environment and many of them had never been to a national park before they visited Stones River. So to see them light up, their faces light up yeah. when they, when they, you know, see a bluebird or a photograph of a white-tailed deer uh, is super exciting because you don't know where that passion or where that interest is going to take them. Uh, hopefully um, <laughs> somewhere they want to go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, do you have any lasting thoughts or words of wisdom you want to share? You've already, you've already shared quite a few though. Um, no, well, don't be like me and settle for a corporate job because you made poor decisions early on in life. You know, the decisions that I made early on to, to quit school, um, you know, really limited my options. Um, in fact, I had someone once, I told, they asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, I wanted to be a park ranger. And they said, oh, you'll never get that job. They're so competitive. And at the time I had no confidence and I listened to that person. I allowed that person to dissuade me from doing what it is that I wanted to do. You know, and I had to wait 20 years to, to make it happen. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. Well, well park ranger, I'm not as surprised at, but you said that you knew about conservation careers in the 90s, I think you you mentioned that and like I didn't even know you could become a wildlife biologist like all I knew of was Jane Goodall and then yeah I didn't know about park rangers but I thought they were more law enforcement and I didn't want to do that but I had no like it took me to go to study abroad in Kenya for me to learn that there were wildlife biology jobs in here in the U.S. because although I admired what Jane Goodall did it was a little too extreme for me I couldn't just be that remote that far away from my family for that long my, my family were, we love nature, but my parents were not outdoorsy. So we would actually stay in hotels when we visited state parks. I, I never went camping until I was older. <laughs> so, um, well, yes, yeah, so I didn't even know you could become a wildlife biologist. I didn't know that was a job. Well, you know, again, I, it goes back to citizen science. I didn't know what a breeding bird survey was. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and after I learned about that, I learned about the Audubon Christmas count and how folks go out every year in December and they try to census bird populations, uh, write down everything that they see. And that was super exciting to me and just, you know, wet my appetite. And um, today, the Breeding Bird Survey and the Audubon Christmas counts are some of the most important uh, climate data sets that we have mm -hmm. because they're big their long duration and they're showing, you know, the ranges of these birds moving over time as, as climate forces them to move towards the poles. So that's a lot of information. It all started with, yeah, I'm willing to, to go out and look at birds. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, put yourself out there. That, that's some advice, you know, do get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, yeah. That's when you really learn. That's great advice. Well, thank you so much and good luck with your project. I hope you keep the animals safe from crossing the road. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate you having me on. The first takeaway I wanna talk about is how he used his volunteer experience and his work with citizen science in particular to really build up a resume of experience even though he wasn't professionally hired or officially hired in that field. And I know we talk a lot about barriers to entry in this field, but one thing that I want to talk about is that there are some things that you can do on your own. And he mentioned about the passion coming through. So a lot of people are frustrated because they cannot get that first experience. I see on these, these, um, these Facebook groups that people are applying for hundreds of jobs, like literally they write hundreds of jobs and they're not getting any interviews, any offers. So one of my tips is to participate in a citizen science program because you don't have to be interviewed for that. And there are a lot of citizen science projects that you can do on your own too. So even during these COVID times, there's still opportunities for you. For example, if you're really interested in birds, sign up for eBird and do eBird as much as you can, maybe every weekend, maybe every day, if you do it at your, your home too. When I was in field work, I, um, we would have breakfast outside and we would essentially do eBird in just a notebook though. We didn't, we didn't um, this was actually before we knew about eBird. Um, I'm sure it was around, but anyway, we used to count the birds that we saw and we kept note of it. So if you do this on your own, I guarantee you, if you include this on your resume and you write about your cover letter, that passion will come through. And I actually think that if you were not able to get any offers, this show is like incredible perseverance because you're not letting people get in your way. You are doing something no matter what, and you're going to learn those birds. You're going to learn how to be a better birder, and you can talk about those skills in your cover letter and in your resume, even though you were never officially hired for a job. The second point I want to cover is about the transition of previous um, job experiences or, or even non-job experiences. This can be, again, volunteer work, but that are not related to wildlife to, um, to the current career that you are applying for. A lot of people think that these skills are not that important. Like what's really important in wildlife jobs is anesthetizing the, or, or tranquilizing the coyote and collaring the animal. But honestly, a lot of these jobs, they really want things like, especially like basic communication skills, because as scientists, we are not taught that. So if you have been working a regular minimum wage job, but you have really excellent customer service skills and you can make that come across and even um, do something creative like in the interview, like how Jeffrey said he asked to do a presentation. If you know that you excel somewhere, you can make that a feature, make them notice that. I just love that he said that. But I don't want you to forget about these other job skills that you may have acquired or other areas of expertise that you excel at. I want you to think about how you can transfer those into the job that you're applying for. And then my final takeaway is to listen to your intuition. And this is what Jeffrey talks about at the end. I think 
so frequently just at least here in the United States, but especially with science, we are really right-brained. We are, I think that's the right, right, I think that's the right side, but we're very analytical thinking. We are making decisions with logic and reason, but sometimes you have this pull inside you that is telling you to go in a certain direction. And when it comes to careers, something that you're going to be doing for a long time, for many hours in a day, it's really important that you're happy. And this is something I teach in my Confusion to Clarity course. We don't just go over the different types of careers and the different types of workplaces, but we do the deep work into knowing what you really want and why you want this career. And for someone like Jeffrey, he needed to make it his career. But for somebody else, maybe they are willing to do the corporate world for a while until they make enough money and then retire and do uh, uh, the rest of their life doing conservation work abroad and, and living um, very cheaply with in a very remote area. There's so many different cool um, possibilities right now. Actually, that reminds me, I want to talk about one more thing. So yes, listen to your intuition. And if you're not happy in your corporate job, then make the transition. That being said, um, he did talk about having a salary cut. I feel like a lot of people make these decisions and they don't look into um, their realistic situation. So also in my Confusion to Clarity course, I give a budget and I actually have an exercise where you plan your 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 future. You choose a, a job, you choose out of the jobs that you're interested in, you choose a salary and you plan for what it would like to um, be that in a certain area of the world that you want to live in. So thank you guys so much for listening to this interview. I hope you found it as helpful as I did.